Okay? All right, digestive system, guys. Um, big picture, what are we, what's our system here? What's our, our uh, digestive system all about? Well, everybody has a handout. Somebody need it? Good. All right. So, um, obviously, it's a system that's going to be responsible for nourishing your, your body, right? For providing the nutrition you, have, you need and for, uh, for being able to then eliminate what's left over, all right? But truly, its, its purpose is to nourish your system with, with molecules for energy, with building block molecules and so forth, all right? And so when we break that down, we're talking about what? We're talking about the ingestion of food. So you have mouth parts, right, that allow you to take that food in, to um, moisturize that food in a way that it's not going to get stuck halfway down, to begin to introduce enzymes into that food, to disinfect it, all right, and I should say before saying the disinfecting, to, to break it down into a manageable size, right? Which for us, because of the arrangement of our larynx, this is one of those examples, all right, in nature where, you know, oh, it's so perfect. It's not perfect, right? That's why people choke in restaurants and die, all right? Because it's not perfect. In fact, it's actually pretty poor. You have to really chew your food really well. You don't think about it because you're so used to doing it. But you have to chew it really well so you don't choke because you have that larynx there that allows you to have voice. All right? My dog doesn't have voice. And so when I give her even the nicest treat, she doesn't savor it. I tell her, chew that. Enjoy it. No. Gone. That's gone. Swallow it. Big thing. Swallow it whole. Right? Because... The system, her system doesn't have that larynx there, all right, that, that compromises her ability. Her barking is just, it's not vocal folds, all right? It's just air moving through that, yeah, okay. Unless your dog <laughs> is articulate in its barking, Edie, that I don't know about. Okay, all right. So, it, it, yeah, we love our pets. Okay, so purification, all right? So you ingest food. Um, and part of your digestive system is going to work towards disinfecting and detoxifying. All right? Disinfecting occurs when the food drops down into the stomach, in particular, where you've got acids there waiting to kill bacteria. But you also have antibodies in your saliva. You've got an enzyme called lysozyme in your saliva that breaks down the cell wall of bacteria. So you've got various... Uh, um, assets for, for disinfecting the food you eat. In addition, detoxification. When you eat food and you absorb that food into your system, the blood supply from your digestive tract goes to the liver before it sees any other part of your body. Everything that you absorb across your digestive tract goes to the liver first and then onwards to the rest of the body. And the reason for that is, among other things, that your liver is responsible for removing any toxic materials that are in that, all right, and doing the detox, all right. And so uh, you have this system then for detoxifying, all right. Propulsion by peristalsis and segmentation. So up here in the upper figure, you see peristalsis. And peristalsis is, if I'm... Uh, if I'm uh, taking some sausage, some nice Italian sausage, and I want to get the meat out of the casing, all right, I'm going to just squeeze it with my finger, make a tight ring, and then I'm just going to pull my finger along all right, my, that tight ring and just move it down the length of that sausage casing. All right? That's peristalsis. It's a one-way movement all right, that involves a sequential con uh, contraction of the musculature. So it's one way, all right? Your esophagus does that. That's different from what's happening in your small intestine, which is called segmentation, all right? And that's a two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back kind of movement. You see it in the lower figure here. And the benefit of that is it isn't just to convey the food from mouth to stomach one direction. It's to mix it and move it and allow you to thoroughly break it down, and ultimately allow you to thoroughly absorb 
the, the, the nutrients there. All right, so that's a different muscular action. It's called segmentation, all right, and that's characteristic of what happens in your small intestine, all right. In order to accomplish these digestive functions, we're going to see that there are glands throughout this system, both intrinsic and extrinsic, and what I mean intrinsic meaning glands that are built right into the wall of the digestive tract or glands that are apart from the digestive tract, like your salivary glands, right? You've got your parotid glands right up here, all right, and your mouth, or you've got your submandibular and sublingual salivary glands here, all right? Your liver is an extrinsic gland. Your pancreas is an extrinsic gland, all right? Whereas all the little tiny glands in the wall of the stomach, they're intrinsic, all right? They're built into the tube itself. Right? And so we're going to see all kinds of glands that are involved in exocrine secretion of saliva up here in the mouth and its various components of acids and enzymes in the stomach, of a whole different complement of enzymes in the small intestine, of mucus throughout the tube. All right? Almost from one end of the tube to the other, you're secreting mucus all right, to keep things lubricated to protect the lining of the of the digestive tract okay all right when we talk about digestion important function all right we think about it in two phases all right there's mechanical digestion which is really just parsing down the food into a manageable size right so your your chewing with your teeth is the action of mechanical digestion all right from there on out, beyond that, it's mostly chemical digestion. It's the action of enzymes on the various macromolecules in the food that you eat. So you're taking big polysaccharides, big long chain sugars, and breaking them down into individual sugars. You're taking big chains of amino acids that we call proteins and breaking them down into individual amino acids. All right? You're taking fat molecules and, and paring them down into smaller size because absorption all right, the next function only occurs at what we'll call the monomer level, the building block level. You can't absorb a whole protein. You can only absorb the building blocks of the protein, so you have to digest it chemically down to its building blocks or its monomers, all right? And monomers are monosaccharides, and monomers are amino acids, all right? And monomers are fatty acids, all right? Monomers are monoglycerides. You don't have to know those names, but if you're familiar with them, then that may mean something to you, all right? Now, once you've digested, you absorb, all right? And then there's stuff that's left behind, all right? Things that you don't have the chemistry to be able to digest. Example, cellulose, right? When you eat salad as roughage, all right? You call it roughage because it's something that you're unable to digest, so it stays within this tube, all right? And passes down through your colon and works like a little scrub brush to help to remove uh, the old epithelium and allow you to to regenerate a new epithelium. So you produce wastes then of undigestibles, all right? And the process of getting rid of those is called elimination. Elimination. And I make a point of this because you, you don't want to confuse that word with excretion. Those are two very different things, all right? Elimination is ridding the body of materials that were in the gut and never were part of your body, right? Because your gut isn't really inside your body, is it? Your gut isn't sterile. So at least your, your colon isn't, all right? It's like putting your finger in the hole in a donut. Are you inside the donut when you put your finger in the hole in the donut? No. You're still outside the donut, aren't you? All right? That's your digestive tract, okay? All right? So elimination, all right, is getting rid of stuff that never was in the body. It was in the gut all the time, and you're just simply letting it pass through, all right, maybe storing it for a while till it's convenient to get rid of it, all right. Excretion is getting rid of cellular wastes, all right, getting rid of cellular waste. So 
what are some of the wastes that are delivered into your digestive tract that were produced by your cells? Well, when red blood cells wear out, which is after about 120 days, right, your liver and your spleen remove those spent red blood cells. They take the hemoglobin, they remove the central part of that molecule called the heme portion, and they convert it into something called bilirubin. That's a cellular waste product of cells that have broken down that were in your body, right? And you're going to get rid of that, right? And that's going to find its way from your liver through your biliary system into your digestive tract. So you are excreting something, all right? Now you have two other excretory systems that get rid of cellular waste just while we're on that. What are those two other excretory systems? Your kidneys are getting, cell getting rid of cellular waste, mostly urea, a pneumonia byproduct, all right, or a, 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 um, a, a converted molecule from ammonia, all right? So that's one. What's the other? Huh? Your lungs. Yes, big hint. <sighs> Your lungs. Your lungs, right? Didn't we say that? What's CO2 if not a waste product of metabolism that we talked about? You need to get rid of CO2. Yes, you all know that now. All right. Okay, so yes, your lungs are an excretory organ just like your kidneys are and now your digestive tract. Although, oddly enough, for all the getting rid of that the digestive tract does, it doesn't do a lot of excretion, all right? Okay, it does some, but not a lot, okay? It's, um, it's a minor function, really. Okay, so we're going to look at this tube, and it's, um, the GI tract is a 30-foot long tube, 30 feet. Think about that, all right? Nine yards, all right? Like I always say, the whole nine yards, right? Right, from your mouth to your anus, it's nine yards. That's not where that expression comes from, though. No. All right, what does that expression come from? I've taught you guys before, some of you. That's right, it's the volume of cement in a cement mixer, nine yards. Now you learn something. All right, so, but your digestive tract is nine yards, all right, 30 feet, more or less. All right, and it extends then from your mouth to your anus, and you can see it here. All right, the oral cavity, and then going back into the pharynx, and then the tube that connects from the uh, bottom of the oropharynx, or from the bottom of the laryngopharynx down to your stomach. That is your esophagus. All right, this muscular tube going down into your stomach, then, and then the small intestine, which constitutes the majority of this distance. All right, there's your small intestine, and then your large intestine, also known as the colon. All right, large intestine, colon, same thing. All right, that's the tube. Associated with this tube, you have the accessory organs. All right, your teeth, your tongue, your salivary glands, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas. All right, those are all accessory organs. And we're going to talk about these. What I want to finish up with here tonight is to describe something that's pretty interesting from an anatomical point of view. And that is that if I take a cross section through the esophagus or through any part of the stomach, small or large intestine, they all share a basic um, organization of tissues, all right? And they are organized as four concentric layers, all right? They change a little bit as you go. Even the mouth ha shares this, all right? But certainly from the esophagus, stomach, small, large intestine, they all share this basic cross-sectional organization of four layers, all right? And um, here you see two different figures that sort of uh, demonstrate those layers for you. The innermost layer is called the mucosa, and it is the lining, the epithelial lining, which changes, right? The lining of the esophagus, what do you think that is? Stratified squamous, right? A lot of abrasion there, stratified squamous, all right? The lining of the, of the, of the small intestine is that simple columnar epithelium, right? So the epithelium changes, 
But still, the mucosa has the epithelium and the layer right under the epithelium of connective tissue is called the lamina propria. What kind of tissue is that? It's alveolar, right? Alveolar connective tissue, right? It's that very little loose connective tissue, all right? Areolar, pardon me. Areolar, my bad. All right, yeah, areolar, can, thank you. Areolar connective tissue. I'm still in lungs here. And, and then finally, a very thin wisp of muscle, all right, called the muscularis mucosa. And this is a thin little layer of smooth muscle cells that basically bring about localized movement. You can think about it as just stirring things up right at the, at the lining surface, all right, and the purpose of stirring things up right at the lining surface is to be sure that you maintain nice high concentration gradients. All right, so you have a little bit of contractile activity right at the surface. This isn't responsible for moving food through the system. All right, that we, we look to something else for that. All right, the next layer is the submucosa. All right, and the submucosa is that next deepest layer. It's mostly connective tissue, but embedded in that connective tissue are blood vessels to supply the mucosa, all the capillaries that are going to absorb food, a bunch of glands, all right, that have ducts reaching up through the mucosa and secreting into the, the space of the intestine, the lumen, and a group of nerve cells called the submucosal plexus, all right, the submucosal plexus, which is um, controlling what's happening at the surface of the, at the inner surface of the gut. Right, controlling those smooth muscles, controlling the activity of those glands, sensing, doing some sensory stuff, what's in the gut. All right, so that's the submucosa. All right, very thin layer. The third layer is the most robust of all, all right, and it is the muscularis externa. And you see it here in two layers here, all right, this one here and this one here. And this is two layers of smooth muscle that throughout most of the digestive tract are organized as an inner circular layer where the fibers of smooth muscle are arranged circularly. All right, what happens if they contract? Circular fibers, what happens? The diameter decreases, all right? So an inner circular layer and then an outer longitudinal layer. Muscle fibers running longwise, what happens if they contract? It shortens the tube, right? The combined activity of the inner circular and outer longitudinal layers is responsible for peristalsis and it's responsible for segmentation, all right? That's how you bring about those kinds of movements, all right? And in between the two layers is a bunch of nerves that control the two muscle layers, all right? And that's, that's called the myenteric plexus, all right? Um, that controls that, okay? And then finally, the outermost covering is what? It's called the serosa. And what is it? Give it another name. No, 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 no. It is a serous membrane, serosa, serous membrane. That was easy. All right, okay, that's all right. All right, serosa, serous membrane. Yeah, yeah. Give it another name. It is the visceral peritoneum. Let's just use the lung as an example. What is this? The, the visceral pleura, right? What is this? It's a serous membrane, all right? And down in the abdominal cavity, it's the visceral peritoneum, right? It's that layer of serous membrane that eventually reflects back and becomes also the lining of the body cavity, which is called the parietal peritoneum, all right? So the serous membrane and visceral, the serosa and visceral peritoneum are one and the same. They are serous membranes right on. They're serous membranes, okay? So they lubricate and allow your digestive organs to slide past one another. So when you have, a, you know, you eat that big Chipotle burger, all right? I don't see a big lump over here, do I? Because everything slides over, huh? No, they, that's what I just call them. They're Chipotle burgers. Whatever. Um, there's a few places where you don't have a serosa. Your esophagus is one of them. 
all right? Your rectum is another, the duodenum is another, and that's because those parts of the tube are anchored in place. They're not slipping and sliding around. So you have a bit of fibrous connective tissue there. It's also known as an adventitia, adventitia or fibrous connection instead of a serosal, and that way it's not sliding around. You don't want your, where do you want your esophagus? You want it sitting in your trachea. You want it flapping around back there, right? You want it sitting right behind the, the trachea, all right? And likewise, the duodenum is anchored in place. Your rectum is anchored in place, okay? All right, guys, we'll stop there. Um, have a nice weekend. Please stay current. Stay current. Don't fall behind. Come and see me to look at your test.